Hello, everybody. Welcome to the JF Media Show. The JAEF Media Show. My name is Calvin Cavanda, and I am your host for today. The privilege and honor is mine. This is episode 11 of our series called Precept Upon Precept, Line Upon Line. Twice in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 to 13, the Lord says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. And we are journeying through the book of Colossians, trying to unpack what does what is contained in the last will and testament that Paul is writing to the church in Colossae to be filled with the knowledge of his will and spiritual, with the knowledge of his will, wisdom, and spiritual understanding in? What, is, what are the details of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ? What is contained in that? What is so valuable about it? What is so precious about it? Because Paul writes to the church in Colossae telling them that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And he starts to talk about those things. And basically, we find out that we are redeemed. We are forgiven, we are translated, we are qualified, and we are um, we are delivered, we are translated, we set off of being qualified to be partakers of the last will and testament. We are delivered. We are conveyed, we are redeemed, we are forgiven from powers of darkness, from the powers that be, the things that shake you and I. Paul is revealing to us some mysteries, but apparently this is not head knowledge. We cannot just receive it as head knowledge. Paul is exhorting us that this can only be received as spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's the journey that we're on. How can you walk in the newness of life that Jesus Christ has purchased for us in your everyday life as a Christian? Before we go in further, I'd like to find out, how are you doing? My brother, my sister, my friend, how are you doing? I hope that you're doing well, and I pray that for whatever reason, if you're not, at whatever point during the airing of this broadcast that you decide to hit exit, that the power of God will comfort you on your way, will accompany you on your way out, will comfort you and turn your situation around as I've said over and over, activate your faith. The scripture says when the word of God is being taught, the power of God is present to heal, to deliver, and to move. So there's certain spiritual heights that we are hoping to attain, and we can only do that by the empowerment of none other than the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, the reveal of the mysteries. The Spirit of God who knows everything about God. Isn't it amazing that there's someone who knows everything about God and it is His Spirit? So let's invite Him in to take us on a ride. Father, Thank you once again for the privilege to be seated at the feet of your word. Your word is truth. It is our shield and buckler. Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is the truth. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And your word is pure, like silver tried in the furnace of the earth seven times. You've gone beyond that and magnified your word even above all of your name. So, Father, we thank you for your integrity. 
Lord, you know that we're living in the days of Isaiah chapter 60. The prophetic words of Isaiah 60 that say, Darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Lord, you know the darkness that is upon the earth. Men's, men and women's hearts are failing them for the pressures that is coming on the earth. Mentally, socially, economically, physically, spiritually, there's darkness in every aspect of life. But we have this promise that the entrance of thy word gives us light. And you've told us to arise and shine for our light has come. But our light can only shine when your light first shines within us with the light of your word. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you, Spirit of the living God, the revealer of the mysteries of Elohim. We invite you in. Take over this atmosphere, this recording, this airspace. Holy Spirit, I ask that you touch your authority, your sevenfold spirit to this recording, that wherever it is heard, Jesus will be proclaimed, magnified, and glorified. I ask that you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, Open our minds to understand the reality of spiritual truth, of the spiritual realm, of spiritual truth and realities that affect the realm that we live in of time, space, and matter. In fact, a realm that supersedes this natural realm. And the Bible, I ask that you open our hearts to receive your engrafted word with meekness that is able to save our souls and it is in the mightiest matchless name of our lord jesus christ yeshua hamashiach that we pray amen now we're just going to dive in um tune in to other broadcasts i trust that you will be tremendously blessed there'll be something that satisfies you that feeds you and yeah so Precept upon precept, line upon line. Colossians chapter 1 is where we still are. There's no need to run. The Holy Spirit had to slow me down and say, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? So sit down, because today we're going even deeper, 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 deeper. By now, you know the premise. Paul's writing to the church in Colossae. They have received the gospel. Certain things have started to happen. He tells them, I'm glad. I'm happy that you are on board. However, I need to catch you up to speed with some details. That you were left with an inheritance. The last will and testament of Jesus Christ. However, he tells them that it is sealed. It is locked. The way we can get the details of that last will and testament that Jesus Christ has left for all of mankind and humanity is it comes in in the form of knowledge of his will and knowledge and he calls it wisdom and spiritual understanding. The download comes in as a spiritual download. In the last episode, we spent time seeing Jesus teaching us through the parable of the sower that this spiritual download is sown onto the soil of your heart. And there's certain things that will chalk it and prevent it from birthing froth, the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we, uh, we probably now had three episodes, I believe, that have been solely dedicated to the heart posture that you receive this knowledge, this wisdom, on the soil of your heart you cannot bypass the system that's how the system has been designed james told us you cannot have a fig tree give you olives likewise you cannot have a grapevine give you figs says you cannot have a, a spring of water shooting out fresh water and salty water likewise your heart has been designed that you cannot produce kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness they don't mix. One will override the other. If you sow in enough light, light shines out of darkness. 
But if you allow weeds to come into your heart, as Jesus said, persecution arises, tribulation arises for the word's sake. Then he talks about another soil that he said, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, basically the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They enter in, they chalk the word, and it doesn't bear fruit. So we've dealt with all of that. And right now, I want to dive into continuing to unpack what is in this last will and testament. Because I believe we, we know enough, we, we, we have received a certain portion that we can sow those seeds onto our heart and they can start to grow. But it doesn't end there. The last will and testament of Jesus Christ is still being read. So we still need to find out what is in there. Because the more we know, it says the people that know their God will be strong and do exploits. It says that if you faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is weak. And it says a man of knowledge will increase in understanding and um, a man of understanding increases in strength. I probably messed that one up. Let me find it. <laughs> Yes, a man of wisdom, Proverbs 24, verse 5 says, A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. Because there are, when Paul is talking to us in Ephesians, he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Right? Pulling down of strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity through the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. But he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So the more that we know about the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the more weapons we have to pull down strongholds, to cast down every argument. Because in spiritual warfare, there's dimensions you get into, and it is legal ground. Who has legal advantage? So if you don't have legal advantage, Satan is winning. But if we can have legal advantage, the scripture says, present your strong reasons. When we go into the courts of legislation, intercessory, intercessory play, prayer, uh, supplication, we need more knowledge. Of what is in the last will and testament because we're trying to pull down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God. That means there are certain strongholds that are higher because it says the strongholds are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. So if the knowledge of God is a level three type of knowledge, the stronghold would be a level three type of stronghold. However, as the knowledge of God increases, meaning a knowledge of God that brings you into access and shields you, a knowledge of God that fortifies you and is supposed to be a hedge of protection against the kingdom of darkness that Paul reveals to us that we've been translated out of, there are certain enemies that will try to come and exalt every knowledge of God. Every knowledge of God is not on the same level. There's, not, there's level 3, there's level 4, there's level 5, there's level 10. So there is a stronghold that wants to come against a certain every knowledge of God that exists. So there's, for, for certain strongholds, we need more knowledge. We need more knowledge. Every stronghold is not fought with the same degree of knowledge. 
That's why we need to know what are the seeds, what are the spiritual wisdom can we download so that we can sow into our hearts. Do you see where I'm coming? He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. He says, casting down arguments. Where are you casting them from? You're casting down from a certain height. And it says, and every high thing that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now that we have a knowledge, we need, you think about it, like there's the certain prisoners that are famous from breaking out of prisons. It means those prisons were not strong enough. That means when we capture Satan, when we ca capture the wiles of the, of the devil, we have to have a knowledge that is strong enough to keep them locked up in there. Because I say, bringing them into every thought, in, into captivity. Before we were captives, now we bring captivity into captive. So before Satan had us captive, now we're bringing him captive. It, it, it is spiritual warfare because the some enemies you you shoo away. There's some others you bring into captivity. Not everything we cast away. There's some enemies you can't let them be on the loose. Because they are going to commit the crimes and offenses that they previously did. There's certain prisoners, there's some lawbreakers, we put them into prisons. So you have to fortify your spirit, man with a certain type of knowledge because certain and this and you always hear this is that certain people they might receive a healing they might receive a deliverance even jesus said that <laughs> jesus said that when when an evil spirit is cast out of a man he will leave he will go into the wilderness he'll go walking around seeking dry places and if he findeth none he will come back into his house, although finding it swept and garnished, but it's empty. So we need to fortify our spirit house such that when the enemy comes in trying to knock again to enter into that place, there's a security system in place. So certain Christians, they might go to a crusade. In a crusade, faith is high. Deliverances happen. Faith is high. But the enemy will wait for you after the crusade ground, on church, after service, the moment you're in your car driving back. Because you don't have sufficient knowledge. So that enemy that another person says, says one shall chase a thousand, two shall put to, uh, ten thousand to flight. In a church, you have other people with you. They're helping you chase their enemies. You're helping them chase their enemies. It's group work. It's teamwork. But what happens when you go back home? On a Tuesday, do you have the knowledge to stand having done all to stand? Do you have the knowledge to stand having done all to stand? So the deeper knowledge we have, it's telling us the more fortified we shall be to bring into captivity things to the obedience of Christ. Okay? So, verse, um, I'll just read downwards, but we'll read, we'll, really start from verse 19. That's where we're going to start. I've been wanting to get into some of these things here. So I'll read again downwards. Verse, verse 13, he says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We are redeemed through His blood, 
the forgiveness of sins. Then he talks about the our new uh, the king of the of basically the king that came and took us that, that delivered us. He tells us he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. He says, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Okay, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. We spent a lot of time talking about all these things. I want to keep trekking along. Verse 19. He says, For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. I'll read downwards, and then after that we'll come back, and verse 19 downwards will go precept upon precept, line upon line. So. Paul has already established basically the, the details of this last will and testament. You are qualified to be a partaker. You are redeemed, translated. You are delivered and forgiven, right? He's established that. Qualified to be a partaker, delivered from the power of darkness, conveyed into another kingdom. So you're not just delivered and left in the middle, no, you're translated into another kingdom. In that kingdom, through the kingdom, we have redemption. How? Through the blood. And then what? The forgiveness of sins. So there's five things that have happened. Then he now goes into talking about the type of king that came to deliver us. That's verse 15 to 18. He tells us about this king to give us assurance that you should not be afraid that the kingdom into which you've been translated or delivered, the kingdom of the son of his love, the kingdom of light, that it is a stronger kingdom than the kingdom that was oppressing you. He tells us why. Because it says he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. The king, our king, Jesus Christ. The Lord of lords, the king of kings. He says, for by him, apparently, back in the day, all things were created. And it's telling you things that are in heaven and things that are on the earth, not just everywhere, in heaven and on earth. He tells you visible where you can see the mountains, the, the oceans, the moon, the sun, the stars, the, all of this. But he also says there's invisible things that this king created. It says thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. It says all things were created through him and for him. He says, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he says, this king is now the head of the body. We are the body. He's the head. The church. Church doesn't mean building. Church means the called at once. Ecclesia. The chosen generation. The royal priesthood. The royal priesthood. He says, he's the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. Then in all things. He has preeminence. He has final say. That's the backstory. Then he, he starts to talk, give us more details on what really happened. How did it happen? Okay, verse 19. Now, what we're going to be doing from here for, for, for now, at least moving for, for, from 19 to 29, we're going to be doing, you know, phrase and word extract. And trying to see, at least for as many words and phrases as we can, what do they really mean? Remember, the scripture says, if you faint in the, ad in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Where does strength come from? It says, a wise man is full of strength. Proverbs 24 verse 5. And a man of knowledge enhances his might. It says, a wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. I like another one. Ecclesiastes says, wisdom 
is better than weapons of war. Oh, uh, where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Because I really want us to start diving into um um wisdom 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 is better than weapons of war let me quickly find that um Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 18 says wisdom is better wisdom is better than strength verse 16 wisdom is better than strength wisdom is better than weapons of war verse 18 it says so let's go so colossians chapter 1 verse 19 he says, for it pleased the Father, wow, that in him all fullness should dwell. That's a statement in the half. It pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. That's the first statement that I want us to look at here. And for that statement, um, what kind of fullness? What kind of fullness? What kind of fullness? It says, for it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. Remember that in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 he say that he, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Okay. Let us explore that more. I would like to invite Hebrews chapter 1 verse But please the Father in him all fullness should dwell. Let's see here. Hebrews chapter 1. What does that have to say to us? So what I'm what I'm gonna be doing is that so we have a statement, and sometimes with scripture, you you first have to allow yourself to go wide before you come back narrow. So we have a statement. This is how I would typically uh, deal with this if I was on my own. I come across a statement like this. In him all fullness should dwell. Now, of course, if you know, if you've been reading scripture for some time, the Holy Spirit will enlighten you, will bring some scriptures to your remembrance. So you use these scriptures to construct an image of, a, of another scripture or a statement, or to build layers of understanding of a certain phrase. So now the phrase, um, and I'm, I'm, I haven't literally, what I have here is scriptures, so I'm just leaning on the Holy Spirit to give me utterance. Um, I always like to eat fresh manna. One of the things that I did, and I found this from someone else, uh, listening to someone else that say they did the same thing, my first Bible, where I really started to underline things, I, I got another Bible that is not marked at all. I literally read it with no markings. So 
Uh, I have one that is marked all over the place. But there's one that I have that has no markings. I do have uh, page markers, like these little stickies that I, I put in just to help me uh, if I'm reading somewhere. Uh, they help me know where I'm reading in that book or where I am and stuff like that. But the reason is because there's always fresh manner. If you, this has been a challenge for me because I've been reading an unmarked Bible for now, maybe seven months since last year, maybe around November, December, as of this recording. What is today? Today is July 9th. 2024. So around 2023, maybe November is when I put down my Bible that was marked. And it was so hard for me to find scriptures and stuff like that because I'm so used to knowing if I go to that book, I know I've, I've marked it. I have little stickies that I created that on the sides of the pages. So in this one, there's nothing. So, but there's, there's something I'm learning about is that every time I read a text, because it is not marked up, it allows new revelation to flow, to come in. And I'm like, wow. So what I have here is, I've got a phrase. It says, in him all fullness should dwell. I have an idea about it. But if you're doing your Bible study, if you're studying the Word of God, so Okay, what does this mean? Like, what is fullness? And, and, and you, you invite other scriptures to help you construct the image of this phrase. And that's what we're going to do. It's going to be exciting. And let's see where the Spirit of God takes us. So, fullness, fullness. I have several scriptures here. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says something interesting. I'm doing this live, and I'm not ashamed to do it because I want fresh manner. Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So this is a scripture that talks about completeness because we're asking ourselves, what kind of fullness dwells in Jesus Christ? What kind of fullness dwells in him that we should put our hope, our complete hope in him? Uh, the Holy Spirit is releasing some sweet stuff right now. We have to ask ourselves. What is the nature of fullness that dwells in Jesus Christ that he should be the end or be all? And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 reveals something. It says, uh, let me first go there. So there's something I feel the Holy Spirit sharing with us that I want us to communicate. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And it says, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So there's three aspects of of our being, our existence, that apparently sanctification happens. 
the spirit, the soul, and the body. The spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, this is very important because what really separates Jesus Christ from other faiths, and I, and I always have this discussion with people when I go out to share the gospel and I'm talking to different people, I tell them that the difference between Jesus and the other guys is this. Jesus can offer you redemption of your spirit, soul, and body. You see, maybe Buddha was a good guy. Maybe some of these other, quote-unquote, faith leaders came and they did some good works. But they're not able to sanctify you completely on all three dimensions of what we call man. Through Jesus Christ, Jesus, when he defeated death, which we shall see when he died and resurrected, the power of life that was working through Jesus, he tells us in Romans, was able to bring him back from the dead. And even the scripture prophesying, saying, Thy will not suffer, thy will not leave my soul in Sheol. Thy will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, meaning bodily death. Paul tells us in uh, not Romans, First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. He talks about uh, the resurrected body. The other, if you, if you put your faith in other religions, other faith leaders, the issue is this. When you die and your soul and spirit is separated from your body, can they offer redemption to your body? You see, in this world, you might follow someone and say, I like the teachings of Buddha. They're teachings of peace or these other gurus and stuff like that. They might offer some sanctification to the area of your soul. Some enlightenment to your soul. And even you might receive some ability to deal with, to, 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 I've seen some people because of, um, faith or training of the mind, they'll do some, you know, they're able to now numb out pain, walk on hot coals and stuff like that. But it goes beyond that because ultimately that degree of redemption or that suspension of reality that you can attain when it comes to what we call death only one man is left standing. It is only the life in Jesus Christ that can give us a resurrected body, a sanctification of the body. It is only in Jesus dwells a sanctification of the spirit. Full sanctification of the spirit. Full sanctification of the soul. Full sanctification of the body. So if your guy, the guy that you're putting in your faith and hope in, cannot conquer all the forces of darkness or the forces of decay on a spirit, soul, and body level, you have not got the best deal on the market. In Christ, in Jesus, dwells the fullness of spiritual enlightenment. In Christ, Jesus dwells the fullness of enlightenment of the soul. In Christ, Jesus 
dwells eventually the full enlightenment of the body, which will in fact include a transfiguration. That you can tap into an eternal life that will help you deal with sickness and infirmities because by his stripes we are healed. But even up to the beyond that point of where, you see, you can live a life in this side of heaven where you never had to deal with cancer, sicknesses, maybe by working out a good diet, you are able to beat the decay of the human body that comes with aging. But what happens once you die? Paul tells us that there is another sanctification that happens completely of the body. He tells us that this body. Let, let me let me let me just read some of these things. In um, um, so when the scripture says. Excuse me. So when the scripture says that it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell, it's almost as if God was like, the Father was like, I'm going to put everything in one store, Jesus Christ. Meaning that's like you going to your grocery store and you're going to find all the produce you're ever going to need is going to be there. All the vegetables, all the meats. All the big, all the all the baked goods, all the pastries, everything, all the clothing. Basically, it's, it's just gonna be a one-stop shop, like a Costco. You're gonna find hardware. You're gonna find food. You're gonna find meats. You're gonna find clothing. It says all the fullness in Him, all fullness should dwell. Now, I I don't. I want to really. Um, do you see where I'm coming from? This is what separates Jesus from the other guys. So, so I, I use this, and, and, and as a Christian, you should really use this. This is a good way to talk about evangelism and say, listen, we have a spirit a soul, and a body. Through Jesus Christ, we can receive full sanctification in this life and in the life to come. In this life, for your body, sickness, disease, and pain, we can walk in healing. We can walk in divine health. But what happens after we die? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you saw is not made alive unless it dies. And what you saw, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35 downwards. It says, God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Again, he's revealing to us this flesh of man, of animals, of fish, and of birds. He says there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So when I die, my body is sown in corruption. It will break down and decay. But Paul reveals to us that there is also a spiritual conversion. The same way that when you sow a seed, an apple seed of any any seed of any fruit of any tree, 
even Jesus said that unless a corn of seed enters the ground and it dies, it does not spring up. So apparently, even in our full sanctification, something happens at the day of our death. At the day of our physical death, there is another life that starts to happen. A resurrection, a formation of another life starts to happen. And he's telling us that just like it happens with natural seeds, it's the same thing. This body is sown in corruption. However, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. He's telling you what type of body it is. Incorruptible glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Then he says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So Christ was, the scripture says, he's the head of the body, as we just read there in Colossians. In Colossians, it says, uh, he's the head of the body, okay? The church, who is the beginning? He says, he is the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, he may have the preeminence. Now, when I usually talk to people, I tell them this, that the other guys that you're trying to put your hope in, Muhammad, Buddha, Guru Nanak, all of them dudes. The problem is that they, they did not possess the kind of life that transcended, transcended completely that offered full sanctification of your spirit, soul, and body. Jesus showed us that... I don't want to... I'm, I'm getting into it. Jesus redeemed mankind on three levels. He passed down into us. He showed us that death, physical death, is not the end. That there is a life that supersedes it. It's resurrection life. The life of God. Resurrection life. So through Jesus, we have, we can obtain the fullness of resurrection or sanctification when it comes to our bodies now our spirit man was dead by dead meaning it was separated from the spirit of god through the sins of our great 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 grandfathers adam and eve it's interesting that now it says we have received the spirit of the lord it says he that is joined to the he that is joined to the lord is one spirit through Jesus, we have now a sanctification of our spirit, meaning our spirit, which was dead, is brought back to life by the Spirit of God. And then we have a sanctification of the soul, which we call a transformation. The renewal of our minds. So Jesus Christ is the only one that the three aspects of man He's the one-stop shop. He's the only guy that provided a cure, if you may, for physical death, for spiritual death, and for a soul death, death of the soul, death of the mind, will, and emotions. So God designed it that in Jesus Christ, all the fullness dwells. And he reveals something else. He says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, he says, The fast man, Adam, was only a living being or a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So, Muhammad, Buddha, 
Hare Krishna, Guru Nanak, they are not life-giving spirits. They're not. These were men just like the Fas Adam, just living souls. Yes, they could have been enlightened on the soul level, and that trickled down to suspending some, you know, physical, bodily ailments and harm and stuff like that, wellness of the mind. It can affect your physical health. But we're talking about a higher life, a life-giving spirit. Jesus is the only guy because he's the only one who faced what these guys faced, but he had a different kind of power source that was backing him up to override the decay of the spirit, the soul, and the body. So the scripture says, in him all the fullness should dwell. It's like, think of it like you're going to Costco, you need hardware, you can find it there. You need clothing, you can find it there. You need pastries, you can find them there. You need meats, you can find them there. You need any kind of thing you need for your everyday life. You can find it there. So Jesus is the guy we go to for sanctification, enlightenment, fulfillment in these three aspects, spirit, soul, and body. So the fullness that dwells in Jesus Christ is on those levels, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, and that is, all of that has just been, we're still centered on 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. So, um, let, let's see another one here. Um, 45. Let's go. Uh, anyway, let me just even finish reading this. I think this is good for us to read. Verse 46, it says, in verse 45, it says, the first Adam, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The fast man, he's telling us, was of the earth, was made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Meaning the raw material for the body of the second man is not dust. Some people call it angel dust. It's a material that is used to build or mold heavenly bodies. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And it says, And as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And it says, And let us bear that image as well. So, I mean, let me just cruise through this. Verse 50, he says, Now this I said, brethren, that all flesh and blood cannot inherit, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last, at the last trumpet. Uh, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible and we shall be changed. In that moment, we shall experience the full sanctification of the body. The sanctification of the spirit has already happened. We're now joined with the spirit of the Lord. The sanctification of the soul is ongoing, transformation. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put an incorrupt, incorruption and this mortal has put an immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, 
where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay? So I want you to just to uh, ex uh, just start to ponder that. Um, uh, just let's see here. Okay. So think about that. Uh, we're still exploring, what do we call it? Yeah, what, 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 it, what, what is contained in this phrase, in him all the fullness should dwell. Okay, let's look at another scripture here. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Hebrews. Chapter 1. I like this. This will help us. So this is how you explore. This is how you study the Bible. You, you find a phrase. You ask the Holy Spirit to give you other phrases. You bring them together. You start to build the puzzle together. You put it together. You build an image as, as far as you can. Based on the enlightenment that the Holy Spirit gives you. And then... um. So what this does for us as Christians, it means we should have a security. You see, what another person of another faith doesn't have is that they're putting their hope in someone who's dead. I'm putting my hope and faith in someone who's alive. Jesus Christ is still alive. So I know that I am going to walk in the fullness, in his fullness, not in a spiritual manner, in the realm of the soul and the realm of my body so for me this gives me this encourages me that i know when i die and those that i love who have gone on to be with the lord i know that i'm going to see them again there's a hope in that i am also encouraged by knowing that uh if you're someone that has struggled with physical infirmity disabledness and stuff like that, this is the assurance you have that once you put off this body, the next body that you'll put on is not going to be disabled. You won't have to deal with that. You won't have a body that is not, not functioning according to how God intended it to function. So, this is the hope that we have, you know? Anyways, let's see. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 says, God, who, is, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, I need some water. God, who at various times and in various ways, okay, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, says, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, who was appointed, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Here again we go. He has appointed him heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of 
the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There's a handful here. Now, in this text, what I'm trying to find out, I'm using Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, to find out what can I use from this text to take back to this phrase, in him all the fullness should dwell. I'm building a puzzle called, in him all fullness should dwell. I'm trying to find texts. I'm find, trying to find scriptures that I can use to build the tower, the image, the building called in him all fullness should dwell. So far on that construction site, we have 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. And it is re revealed that there's a fullness is coming in the spiritual sense, soul and body. What else is involved? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, is, is mentioning some of the things that we've already read in Colossians chapter 1. It says that in these last days, God is no longer speaking to us through prophets. Well, he does communicate to us, but he says primarily, he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Because what is happening in those days, the prophets, what would happen is that you have the king, the prophet, and the priest. The priest will deal with the duty of uh, sanctification, um, um, atonement, and all of, the, all of the like. The prophet, the Spirit of God would rest upon basically three people. The priest, the prophet, and the king. The prophet would go and bring a word from God, and the prophet will always be the one saying, Thus saith the Lord. But now, Jesus speaks to us directly through his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In John chapter. Jesus is speaking to us directly. So again, this helps us in dismantling other faiths and other denominations, even within the Christian faith, that have put me to men. You can speak directly to Jesus through the Holy Spirit. You don't need a priest. You don't need to pay someone to go to God, to speak to God and then come back. No, you can approach him directly. The scripture is helping us dismantle this aspect that God is unreachable. So a lot of people are in religions where they talk to God, but God doesn't talk to them. But apparently the God of the Bible speaks. He says, he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So he'll speak to you on everything. Because he's the heir of all things. And he also made the worlds. Now, Jesus speaking to us in John chapter 16, say, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, 
who the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. He will take of mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit will take of Jesus and declare it to us. Jesus can speak directly to us through the Spirit of God. So, this notion that you're worshipping a God who doesn't talk to you, is not true. There is a God who talks back to people. Because he created people who talk. So he should be able to talk to them. And apparently, well, evidently, the God of the Bible talks to us. Now it says, Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things by the word of his power. There is a power in his word that he uses to uphold all things. He's the heir of all things. So, everything. This is, we're, 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 we're adding to this phrase, in him all fullness should dwell. We're seeing other types of fullness, other dimensions of fullness that exist in him. You see that? So, he upholds all things. All things. I want you to read that phrase, all things, and receive it as all things. This, the, the reason as to why we need to understand and start getting familiar, comfortable with the fact that Jesus has a saying, all things, and why scripture keeps bringing it back around in him. All fullness. All things, everything, all things, all fullness, all things, all fullness. Is because God has designed it that you will have confidence and faith that Jesus is and can be your one stop shop for everything. Is it about marriage? Yes. Is it about the sun, the moon, the stars? Yes. The mountains, the rivers, yes. Lions, cheetahs, zebra, yes. Vegetation, yes. Trees, yes. Life, yes. Finances, yes. Disappointment, yes. All things in the realm of spirituality, soul, and body. Physical, visible, all things. There's a confidence in knowing that I'm driving to Costco, that's where I'm going to get everything. We're going to do all our shopping there. And this is why in the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20. Because this God is telling you, I have made an avenue that you can access me for everything. Not just on Sunday. You can access me. You can lean on me for your business, for your marriage, for your purity. Every area, for your disappointments, for heartbreak. Every area, he has all the fullness. So since he has made someone in whom all the fullness dwells, he considers it as betrayal as denial, as a slap in the face, when the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Why? Because in me, all fullness dwells. Meaning, you don't, it's not this Greek mythology of the God of the sun, the God of the stars, the God of the moon, the God of love, the God of peace, the God of war. You don't have a million gods. You have one entity in whom all the fullness dwells. 
And it says, you shall have no other gods before me. Point blank. I am it. He's telling us, I have all your bases covered. All things. Physical, time, space, matter. All things. The fullness dwells in him. Because he realizes also, the reason as to why is because there are going to be some other counterfeits. There are going to be false prophets. They're going to be false teachers. They're going to be false doctrines. They're going to be false faiths. They're going to be false messiahs. They're going to be false Christs. They're going to be people that will try to allure you in a, in a, in a certain direction because of your desire to pursue a certain thing. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and laboring and that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, come unto me. He has made himself as the one-stop shop because he is preeminent. He created all things, in him all things consist. Let that simmer. Because in Colossians chapter 2, now Paul is going to start talking of different areas of our lives where we are prone to be prone to attack. And it's because you might think that, yeah, God is only a God of the spiritual stuff. But I cannot, I don't, I cannot really lean on him when it comes to physical things. No. He created the physical, the spiritual, and the soul, the body, time, space, matter. So you can lean on him for all things. That's the thought that is being established in he here. In him, all fullness dwells. Let's try another scripture and see uh, John chapter 5. Verse 22. Let's see what that says to us. Now, this is very interesting. It says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Hmm. Now, that's something there. So judgment, so who's going to judge you? Jesus Christ. It's not going to be Muhammad. It's not going to be Allah. It's not going to be Buddha. Who's going to judge you? God has committed judgment, all judgment, to the Son. So you need to start becoming friends with the guy who's going to be seated in the judgment seat. All judgment. However that speaks to your mind is committed to the Son. It says, verse 20, John chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23 says, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. My goodness. All judgment has been committed to the Son. The thing, though, is that it's almost like we can do, <laughs> we can go three layers deep, and I really want to cover some other types of fullnesses, so even that, we can go to the depths of a judgment. 
But I want you to know, all judgment has been committed to Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's see some other things here that may be interesting. It says, most assuredly, verse 24, I said to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. but has passed from death to life. Verse 27 says, He has given him authority to execute judgment also because he, he is the son of man. Man. Maybe we shall revisit that. I'll make a note of it here. Because there is really some things there for us so we can tap into. Uh, so what other fullness dwells in Jesus? He's going to judge the living and the dead. All judgment has been committed to him in this life and in the life to come. Let's see what Matthew eleven twenty seven says. And maybe we'll see. Uh-huh. I like this. So maybe we'll stop here. And pick up on this in him all fullness should dwell aspect. Matthew eleven twenty seven says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Okay, so Jesus also reveals here that all things have been delivered to me by my Father. Everything, all things have been delivered to him. And because all things have been delivered to the Father, I mean to the Son, because of the Father, Jesus then has... The authority, he has ground to stand on to say, come to me, verse 28, which is spoke, quoted earlier on. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Boy, does humanity need that. So it's interesting when we, we, we talk about the scripture of judgment. All things co co uh, committed to him. And then now Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He's there's, oh, there's dimensions to this. Are you looking for, do you feel like you received a raw deal in life? Jesus says, Come to me. All things have been committed unto me. Come, I can, I can balance you out. Do you feel like someone did something bad to you and they got away with it? Jesus says, come to me. All judgment has been given to me. But you, come to me. I will, I will deal with that case. But he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't it interesting that that sentence Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That the statement that precedes it is an assurance that all things have been delivered to me. He 
he realizes Jesus knows that we are prone to seek rest in other areas, to seek confidence, to seek assurance, to seek honor and accreditation in other places. And he says, you're going to try and get it from somewhere else. You're not going to get the original. You're probably going to get a fake. You're going to get a duplicate. It's not going to be the original. I am the guy who is the distributor of all things. And all judgment has been committed unto me. So why don't you come to me, all you who labor, who are laboring, and those who are heavy laden? Come to me. I am the depot. It's such a an umbrella statement. That's like you, you, you think about it like a corner store. A guy who owns a corner store standing at the, street, at the corner store and saying, come to me, everyone who wants to do any kind of shopping. You look at him as crazy. But like, dude, you just have a corner store. You know, Costco. But you see, Costco can put out an announcement, an ad that says, come to me for all your shopping. Because they have stocked up on everything possible. We're using Costco because it, you know, it has everything, pretty much. But so, Jesus does not say, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. Because that's a very, that's an umbrella statement. All? Come. It says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But it's be, be, the reason and the ground that Jesus can stand on to make that statement is in verse 27. He says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And then he says, come. Then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's interesting that here Jesus is talking about the soul. The same one who promised us resurrection life of the body. He says, he that is joined to the, to, to the Lord is one spirit with him. And now here Jesus knows the sanctification we're seeing from where we said it from, a type of fullness, a sanctification of the soul that Jesus can help us with is rest, a restoration for the soul. Rest for the soul. Wow. So, Um, maybe we'll stop on that and pick up on this in the next episode. We'll, we'll pause for, we'll pause here. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow. Yeah. We'll call it wraps there. Wow, this has been fun. This has been fun. For me, and I hope for you.
Father, thank you once again for the time that we have shared together. Thank you for enlightening our eyes. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies that endure forever. Father, we just thank you for this revelation that truly in you all fullness dwells. Anything we need, you're the river that supplies it. Any fruit we need, you're the garden that supplies it. Any kind of food, you're the garden that supplies it. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, this moment, Holy Spirit, we come. Lead us to him. Lead us to Jesus right now. Many of us have been laboring for a really long time because we did not trust that Jesus has the fullness of all things in him. All the fullness of all things dwells. But Lord, now that we have this knowledge, I first of all, I pray that this knowledge will enlighten our spirit, man. It will now enter our hearts and drive out fear, anxiety, and worry. And second guessing that truly anything that stops us from believing that truly in you all fullness dwells. Jesus, have your way with us. Help us, Lord. To come into the assurance of this spiritual truth. That truly in you all fullness dwells. And Lord you know how many of us have been laboring north, south, east, west. Trying to find a certain fulfillment in some other things. But your word is telling us to come to you. And we're coming. As who have been laboring. As we are heavy laden, Lord, we can to receive this rest that you give. Show us, we let go of the yoke of other things, of the world, of other things. We choose to yoke upon you, to learn of you, for truly you are gentle and lowly in heart. We need rest for our souls and we can only do it by coming to you. So help us to come. Help us to find this rest that you give for our souls. For your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Holy Spirit, you're the one who breaks yokes and removes burdens. Anyone who's been yoking to anything other than Jesus, Holy Spirit, break that yoke right now in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. Every yoke that is not yoked to the yoke of Jesus, we break it right now in the name of Jesus. And we connect to the yoke of Jesus. Because Jesus, your burden is light. And your yoke is easy. So Jesus, we yoke to you. We yoke to you in this moment. Every yoke, every direction that we've been yoked that is not to your yoke, Holy Spirit, Break it right now by the power of God, by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the anointing, by this word of God, by this revelation. We bring every yoke under the obedience that no, we no longer want to be yoked to you. Every yoke of drugs, every yoke of sex addiction, every yoke of pornography, every yoke of lust, every yoke of body image according to what the world calls beautiful, every yoke of pursuing money and the spirit of mammon, every yoke of envy, lust, greed, and I'm going to get you back attitude, and you cut me, I'm going to cut you twice as hard. Every yoke of unforgiveness, we break all manner of such yokes in the name of Jesus. Every yoke of poor self-images that have been sown into us from when we are young, we break those yokes. Every yoke that it says you are snared by the words of your mouth. Every snare that we have carried around by the words of our mouth is broken by the blood of Jesus. Every snare we have carried 
is broken by the name, in the name of just by the blood of Jesus right now. Every yoke, we command you to be broken because now we are yoking unto Jesus. Lord, we are yoking unto you. Receive us again in the name of Jesus. The spirit of laboring. Right now, Holy Spirit, touch and heal everyone that is listening to this who has been laboring and is heavy laden. In the name of Jesus, may that spirit be uplifted. May that mindset that you have to labor, labor and toil, may that mindset be broken in the name of Jesus. You will not labor again. You will not toil again. The disciples said, Master, we have toiled all night and have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the net. Because you showed them where to let down the net and solve their problem that they have been toiling all night. You've been toiling and laboring for your marriage. That is broken right now in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of labor be broken over you. May the spirit and heaviness from heavy ladenness be broken and loosed over you. May your youth be renewed right now as the eagles. May you receive new strength in your bones, new strength in your lungs, new strength in your heart, in your liver, and your kidneys, new strength to keep running, new strength to walk, new strength to fly in the name of Jesus. May your youth be renewed like an eagle's. May you receive eagle's wings right now. May every exhaustion be uplifted off of you. Spirit of heaviness in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of peace surround you. May the spirit of rest for your soul invade you right now in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. In Jesus. Precious, mighty name, we do pray. Amen. Amen, 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 and amen, and amen. Well, that was fun for me. I hope that was fun for you, and not just fun. I hope that helped illuminate your heart, your soul, your mind, and I hope you're excited as we go deeper into precept upon precept, line upon line. My closing words for you today are, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting down all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world but may the god of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by christ jesus after you have suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen once again your brother and your host for this show episode was calvin Cavanda. we hope that this episode blessed your heart thank you for tuning in grace mercy and peace be multiplied unto you and may the lord bless you and keep you from the evil one Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next episode of Precept Upon Precept, Line Upon Line. Goodbye.